Hello and welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales. My name is Rory and you are watching Varietal Literature's YouTube page. And if you've never been here before, well, thanks for checking us out. Um, <clears throat> we do sort of things related to narrative here. And uh, tonight what we'll be doing is reading some old traditional collected folklore, specifically Norwegian, uh, done in a sort of short story format by one of the original collector collectors of Norwegian folklore, if not the original collector, as Bjornsson, Peter Christian as Bjornsson of As Bjornsson and Mo. But before I do that, let me tell you a couple of things about the stream. <clears throat> Down in the description below, there will be timestamps if you're not watching this live, that you can jump ahead to the tales. We are at least going to read one tale tonight, uh, the namesake one, but, um, <clears throat> we can also uh, maybe read a shorter second one that will also be one of Esbjornsson's, um what he called um, uh, Halder Tales. It took me a minute to pull that out of my brain. Um, <clears throat> but if you are watching this live, obviously the timestamps aren't there yet, but you can join us in the live chat, which is verifiably um, softer than moss and smells prettier than wildflowers. So you might want to join in there. There's already a few people in there and they discuss the story as we go along and occasionally derail into discussions of has-been hotel as we are the unofficial, apparently, my chat is the unofficial fan club meeting. Um, so if you're into that, bring it up there. You'll have plenty of conversation. But I'm going to say hello to the folks that are there. Uh, Witchery is there. And Witchery, I must apologize. Last Thursday when I was doing my sign-offs, I knew I was forgetting someone and it was you. Uh, and I apologize. Uh, thank you for watching all the same. Uncle Kitty is there. Hello, Uncle Kitty. I hope your procedure went well last week and you're feeling okay. Tammy Morelli is here. Tammy, I hope you enjoyed your time with your daughter. Um, I know you said you were going to uh, a parade of a Chinese festival. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Jump Store is here and I hope you're doing well today, Jump Store. Uh, I think I think you liked when we read the Holder Tales before, so you might like tonight. Um, <clears throat> uh, I know that Witchery liked the prose because it has a Tolkien aspect to it. And Zombie Wolf is here, and oh, Zombie Wolf, I hope you have some uh, some new random facts uh, in the, in the barrels for the end of the stream. <clears throat> uh, GS is here. Uh, lovely to see you again, GS. Are you working on any new projects? I know you said you were working on your Hello Kitty dress, and I see that. Um, uh, Suki Matsuba is making a a visit. Hello, Suki. Uh, Jumpstore says, yay, I hope we get the bonus story. I always like the bonus stories. Well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> Zombie Wolf says, I'd apologize for turning the conversation to Has-Been Hotel, but a fangirl never apologize for a fan. <laughs> That's okay, as long as people are enjoying themselves. I'm going to have a drink of water. I'm going to explain what the show is about tonight. In a little more detail, though, if you've watched my Holder Tales before, you already know. Uh, and then uh, we're just going to get to reading what is a very excellent story, I think. Okay. Also, let me know if the sound is off or muffled or anything like that. Um... As always, being on this older computer, it uh, randomly changes things sometimes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so Peter Christian Asbjörnsen of Asbjörnsen and Mo uh, is, as I've said before, and I think this is probably the appropriate frame for it. I might be a little too zoomed in. Um... <clears throat> But um, is uh, is the Norwegian Grimm brothers. Uh, there's no real better way to put it because that's exactly what they were. They went around Norway and they collected folklore and tales. But as Bjornsson specifically, Peter Christian S. Bjornsson, not with Mo, created these sort of frame stories that he dubbed Holder Tales. Uh, and I've read them on the stream before. <clears throat> Now, I did explain how those frames worked in that stream, but however, I think I will give an abbreviated account here because they are different enough that I think you as a viewer may be quite confused if I did not. 
um, Halder Tales, uh, invented by Peter Christian S. Bjornsson, although not the the notion how they structure is not his invention. Specifically, the term Halder Tales and stuff is his own invention. Uh, one half of the Norwegian Grimm brothers. Um, <clears throat> the idea is that he tells the collected folklore tales that we normally read out of context, um, but he does so within a story of how he collected them, where the people that told him are characters in a sort of meta narrative. Uh, these semi fictional stories, I don't think I made that clear on the last one, they aren't fully fictional. A lot of them were pretty close to how they actually happened. Um, would have characters in then modern day Norway. We're talking like mid 19th century here. Recounting these tales in conversations with a self insert character of Peter Christian as Bjornsson himself, who is sort of the star in the, the point of view character of these little stories. In other words, as Bjornsson was sort of writing out his collected folklore in a way that would better show us how folklore travels around a countryside and so on. Um, <clears throat> That means, by the way, though, that the first few pages of these stories is going to be things about his journey to get to people, the description of the setting he's in, the description of the person he's talking to. So the first few pages aren't, aren't folklore. And if that's what you came here before, you might be like, what is this? Let's get to the folklore. I would just encourage you to have patience with it because I think the stories are quite rewarding in how they frame them. The way that the folklore comes up naturally in the conversation. <clears throat> But, you know, that may deter some viewers, and that is how it is. That's not the only version that we read. Um, so, um, I should say they were pretty popular last time I read them. I thought they would be unpopular, and I was wrong. But just give them a chance, despite their uh, slower pace. One thing I'll add that I didn't add the first time I read them is that the stories are more non-fiction than you might think. And I didn't really portray this. They aren't one-to-one -one transcriptions or anything like that. But the characters in the story apparently were real characters a lot of the time that Peter Christian as Bjornsson had collected these stories from. And uh, a lot of them weren't very happy with how he portrayed them and apparently stopped talking to him. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I think in our first tale, and possibly only one, the Graveyard Digger, um, we, um, uh, or sorry, the Grave Digger, rather, the Grave Digger's Tales, um, we may see an example of somebody who might have been one of those people. I don't know for sure. All right. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to drink my water and then we are going to set up a little Norwegian countryside soundscape and we'll get right in to finding the grave digger and hearing his tales. Our first tale tonight is called The Grave Digger's Tales. Uh, it is a Holder tale or a meta narrative a collection of folklore by Peter Christian as Bjornsson. And it was translated by Simon Roy Hughes, who is a contemporary who has a bunch of translated Norwegian works, including a personal favorite of mine, uh, Ringalahorn by Regina Norman and uh, erotic fairy uh, folklore <clears throat> uh, from Norway, uh, which will be in a pinned comment below not, uh, where you can purchase them on Amazon, his translations. Um, and I will add some notes from Simon Roy Hughes throughout this because there is some elements of the story I didn't understand without explanation. There is not much for a bathing guest in Eidsville to do except attend to the requisite constitutional walk. I sought out per grave digger, already on my second day, and Storefinsta, 
a good league south of the river. I found the house he lived in after spending some time amidst the disorderly nest <clears throat> of withdrawn outhouses and farmhouses. There was no one in the parlor, but an old woman sat at her spinning in a dusky cabin. I asked her some questions. The first one received no answer more than a measuring look. The second and third were answered with a, huh? When finally asked for the fourth time if she could tell me where Per Grave Digger was, she answered, Oh, it's still a good league to the grave. No, Per Grave Digger, I shouted. Yes. Grave lies to the east. If you go along the valley, you will find it. I later discovered that the neighboring farm was called Grave leading to this confusion. <laughs> Grandmother is hard of hearing, said a voice from a gloomy corner where the light now had begun to reach. It was a young girl with a small child on her arm. Can you tell me where I'll find her grave digger? I asked her. He's not at home, she answered. Don't you know where he is? I suppose he's at Story. At my aunt's. Where's Story, then? On the east side. Is it far? I asked. I don't know. Is no one else at home? No. They've gone to a wedding. What about the next cabin? I don't know. Nevertheless, in the next cabin, I learned what I needed to know. There was nothing for me to do but go on to study. Outside in the gal gallery, I found the aunt in the figure of a tall, dry, middle-aged wife, her gray hair combed up under a black cap. She came to meet me with a measured cordiality and said, May you be pleased to go in. A little disappointed over the difficulty I had already experienced, I asked if Per Grey Digger, Digger should be there. Oh, do you perhaps want to order a grave for someone? She asked. No, not at all. I have heard that it is he is supposed to know a good number of old tales and stories, and I want to hear some of them, I said. Oh, in that case, had old Anders, Per's father, been here? Well, he was the man who could tell. When he began, then it was almost as if there would be no end. Dear God! Can't you find old Anders for me? Yes, I certainly can. Old Anders has been dead two years. Per knows some too, but it's not easy to get him in the mood. He's a little difficult like that, don't you know? No, old Anders, he could tell stories. You didn't need to ask him twice, but it'll be just two years ago this Michaelmas. That doesn't help me much. I interrupted, irritated that the blessed Anders was no longer alive. Isn't here Purr here? I should say I'm going to read this next line, but you should know it doesn't mean what it means in modern context. Please wash your mind and then re-listen to this sentence in your own head with that cleaner frame of mind. <clears throat> Well, blow me if he wasn't here too. It's true, but he wanted to reach the sexton. But you'll find him at the sexton. <clears throat> and if he's not there, then he'll be at Blocken. Or the parsonage. And if he's not digging a grave in the churchyard, old mother Haberstad is dead. My patience was now nearly at an end, but as everything appeared to indicate that one had to have more of this gift than is usual when dealing with her grave digger, I decided to save my last morsel. I tried to move along, but now the wife had taken a translucent glass from the dresser and poured a dram of raw brandy, which she presented to me with a piece of candied sugar on a plate. Well, she grew distant with a series of exclamation about how peerless old Anders had been in the telling of tales. 
Her is nearly certainly at the sexton's, and if not there, then he's at Balkan or at the parsonage, and if he's not in the churchyard, she called after me as I left through the gate. It sounded like mockery, for these were the very places I had just left or passed. I determined, meanwhile, to look for him in the first place, the place that, in her opinion, was the <clears throat> least probable. It was one of those cold, miserable summer days as I went over to the church through the dark alleys of the parsonage gardens. The rain had ceased, but with every gust of wind it drizzled down from the leaves in the crowns of the trees. The fog and the clouds drove low among the tops, the light foul mat and grey across the graves and plain memorials. The wind sowed through the branches, and no bird sang from the foliage. A foreboding of autumn already seemed to pervade this quiet, lonely meadow, wherein only the church stood as a comfort, its tower and spire pointing towards the heavens. From the farthest corner of the churchyard, I heard the clang of a spade. The grave digger stood digging down in a grave on a tuffet close by stood the sexton's magnificent great goat, which I knew well from previous visits with its beard and horns and eating grass. I stood a while and considered the grave digger. He was an aging man, but you could not say that he was aging well. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why they didn't talk to Peter anymore. <clears throat> <clears throat> His vocation did not appear to have any mitigating or reconciliatory influence on his mind, for he looked out upon the world with a bitter expression on his hypochondric face. I felt such physiognomy ought to be somewhat familiar. I searched my memory for it and eventually recognized it from a stubborn horse I once had been troubled with. And when he paused his work to rest for a moment, he looked up and caught sight of me. I'd hitherto stood there unnoticed. Good afternoon, gravedigger, I said. He took measure of me from top to toe spit in his fists, and began to work again. It's a heavy work you have in this wet weather, I continued undeterred. It's no easier in the sunshine, he answered with his vigory grimace, continuing to dig. <clears throat> Who are you digging this grave for? I asked in hope that a conversation might grow from the question. For the devil and the church, the gravedigger answered. I had to ask for an explanation of this. The devil takes the soul. The church gets the money, he replied. Not like that. I meant who will lie in the grave? A dead woman, answered the gravedigger. The bridge was thus demolished. I realized this, this this could not lead to any desirable result. Impatient with the rain, which again had begun to fall, and irritated over what was in all probability a failed expedition, I told the gravedigger that I had sought him out to hear his tales and stories from the olden days. I told him that he certainly would not be telling them for nothing, and that he should even be pleased to tell them to someone like me, who believed in such things that people commonly didn't in our days, etc. Now from time to time during this speech, the gravedigger looked at me with those beady, horse-like eyes. His look threw a dark cast across my hopes. <clears throat> I am just as glad, whether folk believe or disbelieve what I have to tell, he said. But I know what I have heard and what I know. I will not be someone's fool, sitting and telling them stories like some gossip wife, even if it were for the king himself, he added as an extra confirmation. I had already begun to leave. 
When he stopped me once more, half turned away from me after pushing his hat over to one ear, he began to rummage first in one, then in the other waistcoat pocket, but he did not seem to find what he was looking for, and his face grew visibly longer, especially after he had completed a new resultless search of both culpable pockets. I quickly understood that he had run out of tobacco. <clears throat> and in satisfaction thought, now my luck has turned. In my botany crate, I had one of Tiedemann's sought-after quarter rolls, and as I feigned reaching for a handkerchief by means of sleight of hand, I caused that roll to fall on the very edge of the grave he stood in. Quite calmly, I bent down to retrieve it and studied not to notice the ray of sun that had crossed the grave digger's face at the sight. As if lost in thought, I picked it up and I called over my horned friend. I mean, that's more of a sheep, I guess, but that's my goat. <clears throat> Which stood close by on the edge of the grave and let it bite off a big chunk of the tobacco roll. How far is it to Tonsecker? I asked. The grave digger mumbled something about abusing God's gift, but answered more politely than previously that it was about a mile on either side of the sound. And to the gold works, I asked. Seven miles, said the grave digger. Where does this fellow come from, then, if I may be so bold to ask? He added with the oddest of looks on his face. <clears throat> Most recently, I came from Story Finsta, where I asked for per grade digger. I replied, laying the roll back into the crate after giving the goat just one more bite. There was no answer to this, but per grave digger began digging eagerly. Beside earth and stones, he threw up half-rotten splinters and crumbling bones with the spade. And among the bones that rolled towards my feet was a female cranium of such a beautiful shape that Oretius would have considered it an ideal of the Scandinavian type. I picked it up and considered it carefully. Um, Oretius is a Swedish anthropologist. Not anything that would mean anything to us. <clears throat> um, it was no, it was no old woman who owned that skull. The grave digger began again. I see that. I replied. She uh, was a farmer's wife here in the village. She was held in respect and honor. He continued his remark. Indeed. Had the gravedigger remained in his contrariness, he would no doubt have held his tongue now, but a roll of tobacco, even if only the hope of one, had a wonderful effect on his moon, mood. Cranky on the inside, spotless on the outside. No reply from me. But, um, that is a deliciously fine tobacco that which you have there in your tin box this knave thinks so too i replied as i beckoned the goat and made as if to give him more tobacco well if only old anders my father was still alive said the grave digger hastily with an upturned bone he attempted to prevent his happy accomplice from partaking of the goods i had intended to give it he could tell stories what i know is not much now i understand that you too want a piece of tobacco per grave digger look here's what the goat has left for you you would have had the whole roll where had you been more willing before, but tell me something now. I suppose I should then, for I see that you are a fair fellow and not some monkey, replied the gravedigger as he gathered his tools and climbed out of the grave. Damned beast, he shouted maliciously, striking at the goat. Goats are the worst vermin imaginable. They should be slaughtered as many as they are. 
After relieving his heart with these outbursts, he sat himself on a gravestone and began to tell. So we're going to get to the folklore here. A quick content warning. Um, his stories involve execution of... Um, it's a lot to do with witches. And the general opinion of him and most things in folklore is that witches were terrible and deserve to die. Uh, so heads up, this isn't kitty folklore hour. <laughs> This is real folklore. There's a lot of executions and there is a little bit of animal death as well. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, um, hopefully it, that's okay with you. If not, that's okay. You are not the first person I've told this to, he began. If you will believe it, then you may. If you won't believe it, then it's all the same. Now there was a farmer in this village. He'd heard that the witches would gather to play in such at night in the church during the holidays. He didn't believe it, but he thought he'd like to see if it was true. And it'd be fun to see who the witches were in the village. So... On the eve of Easter, he sat himself in a pallet in the church gallery. And just like that, a whole company arrived with a great black dog at their head. And when they came to the church door, the dog stood up on its hind legs, pawed at the door, which opened despite it being locked. <clears throat> Did you see that? said the woman who was closest to the dog to another. And it was her there, here, added the grave digger as he held up the skull. No, I would never have even believed it, even if you'd told me, the other one replied, who walked beside her. And she was a good woman of the village here. So many followed after them now that he almost couldn't keep count. But he knew them all, and he would never have believed that there were so many witches and all rummeric as those he had seen, <clears throat> saw there from Eidsville Parish. They jumped, and they did all the blasphemous things that anyone might imagine, both in the pulpit and on the altar. And when they ran out of things to do, they conjured a cow up into the tower and let it slide down the stairs, all four legs in the air. He thought he recognized the cow as one belonging to the parsonage. When, and when the witches were done and everything was over in the church, then he went to the parsonage. When he came into the stall there, he found the cow. It was quaking and so sweaty that it frothed at the mouth. But then, a long time afterwards, there was once upon a time a wedding and the master of the kitchen at the wedding was the same man who had seen all this on the evening before Easter. And the woman who had led the pack of witches was also there, and when it was time to go to the table, they wanted her to take her seat first, for she was such a good wife, you know. But she was now so bashful and made herself precious without measure. The master of the kitchen begged and pleaded with her to take her seat, but finally he grew wary of this, and so he said to her quite deliberately, Go first, you. You're used to it by now, I should think. You weren't the least bit shy the last time I saw you at Easter when you were the first to dance with old Eric, both on the altar and in the pulpit. Pausing for a moment. Old Eric is a really standard slang that you see in both German and Norwegian folklore and a bunch of other areas, honestly, that means the devil. And also, we can assume that dancing probably means more than dancing. <clears throat> then she fainted from that moment. She had not a single day of good health. The grave digger fell silent, and his face again assumed its dour, contrary expression. But I kept on asking about witches, their journeys and episodes, and examining him for so long that I got him to promise to tell me everything he knew of such things. <clears throat> 
There were some shooters, he began again, who were at a bird like leck. Uh, which is uh, like a, a bird mating ritual. Um, <clears throat> One night at Easter, just as they sat in the hide in the morning twilight, they heard such a roar and rush from the sky, they almost believed it to be a great flock of big birds coming to settle on the marsh. But the devil, it was birds. <clears throat> when they came over the tops of the forest, it was a flock of witches who had been to an Easter lick. They came riding on brooms and muckrakes, on billy goats and nanny goats, and on the most unreasonable things that can be imagined. When they were close by, one of the shooters recognized a witch, for she was a neighbor to one of them. Mar and Mira, he cried, and she fell down in a pine tree and broke her leg at the thigh. For when one recognizes them and calls them by their name, then they have to come down no matter how high. They picked her up and delivered her to the sheriff, and in the end she was to be burned alive. But before they got her up on the pyre, she asked if they'd take the scarf from her eyes a little. Yes, they would do so, but... First they turned her away so that she could not look towards fields and meadows but far out across the hills, and wherever she laid her eyes the forest was scorched quite black. Now this woman left a daughter behind, and they placed her with a parson <clears throat> in Gudbrandstalen. She can't have been more than nine years old, but she was a mean and full of witchery. Once the parson told her to carry some wooden shingles that were lying in the yard into the kitchen. Ah, I'm sure I can get them in there without carrying them, she said. Really, said the parson, let me see. Well, she immediately conjured a wind so that the shingles flew into the kitchen. And the parson asked her if she could do more, and yes, she could. She could milk, she said, but she didn't like to, for it hurt the cattle. The parson asked her to, but she was reluctant. In the end, though, she would do it anyway, so she stuck a knife into the wall and placed a milk churn underneath. And as soon as she touched the knife, the milk ran into the churn. When she'd milk for a while, she wanted to stop. Oh no, you. Continue milking, my child, said the parson. No, she would not, but the parson spoke to her for so long that she began again. Now I must stop, she said after a little while, for otherwise there will only come blood. Oh no, you continue milking, said the parson, and don't you worry about that. And she didn't want to, but eventually she gave in and continued milking. After a while, she said, well, if I don't stop now, the best cow will lie dead in the stall. Milk on, my child. And don't concern yourself about that, said the parson, for he was wanted to see what she could do. She was reluctant, but the parson pressed her until she gave in and continued milking. Now the cow has collapsed, she said, and when they went out to the shed to see the best cow the parson owned lay dead in the stall. So they burned her too, just like they'd done her mother. Yes, she was a terrible witch, that one I've just told you about, continued the gravedigger. But there was one who I think was even worse, for she took her husband out of bed one night and rode on his back all the way from Gudbrandstalen to Bergen. <clears throat> Sorry, I need to drink a water. And well, she was up in the tower observing the Easter lick with the others and old Eric. Her husband had to lie stark naked outside the church, freezing the whole night long, and it was terrible weather. The snow was drifting, and the man was so exhausted that he was desperate. When morning approached, he got up a little, and he was freezing, and his teeth were chattering. 
and just then someone came walking by. In God's name, please tell me where I am, said the man. Well, you're at a church and bargain, he replied, and when he saw the girth that the man wore round his middle, then he understood how things stood. Before I continue on, this is one of the things I had to ask Simon about. What is a girth? Because girth is a measure of, like, roundness um, and width. In this case, that's not what it's a reference to. For those of you who have horses, you already know what this is. But the girth is the belt um, that goes around the belly of the horse, so to speak. And so basically, because he was ridden there by his wife, who was a witch, um, <clears throat> she had apparently put a saddle upon him. Uh, there is a picture drawn of this exact account, um, but it's uh, it's still under copyright. It's not from the original works. Um, <clears throat> so I can't show it here. But uh, that's what he's referencing here, because what comes next in the sentence is very confusing if you don't know that. It's basically a belt for a saddle. <sighs> then he understood how things stood. For witches were both at Easter and at Christmas in those days. And so he said, When she comes out, the one you are with, then take the girth and throw it over her from behind and ride her home again. Or you won't be able to stand it. Well, when the witches came out, the man did as he said, and he rode her home as quick as you like. Didn't she have her grease horn with her? I asked. Pausing again, because I had to ask about this. A grease horn is what it sounds like. It's a horn filled with grease. But I was, I asked, um, I knew that it was used on ships um, and sometimes used as a fire starter, but mostly used on ships to keep things from rusting. But I said, what use did a farmer have for it? And apparently they used to take the grease and use it when they were milking cows because it was a little easier on the hands and the cow's teats. <clears throat> Didn't she have her grease horn with her, I asked. She probably didn't take it with her, for she would have greased her body before she left home, said the grave digger. Now, this is a thing, I don't know where it comes from, but this is a thing with witches. They are often greased. <clears throat> but your talk of grease horn brings my remembrance some stories that are supposed to have happened a long time ago. Let me hear them, I said. On a farm in Ringabo. He said, there was a witch who was terribly bad, but, <clears throat> but there was one who knew she was a witch. He went there and asked if he might spend the night one evening of a weekend, and he was allowed to do. You mustn't be afraid. If you see that I sleep with my eyes open, he said. It's a habit of mind, and I cannot help it. Oh, no, she wouldn't be afraid, she said. Just like that, he began snoring and slept very soundly and with his eyes open. Just as he lay there, the woman took out a large grease horn from beneath a stone in the earth and greased her broomstick. Up here and down here to Jonas sauce she, she said and flew up the chimney to Yulnasos, which is a great mountain pasture the boy thought it would be fun to follow after her and see what she was up to up there for he thought she said up here down here to the ridge beam so he took the horn from beneath the stones in the chimney and greased some firewood up here and down here to Muonsas. And I have to read the fo footnote here because this exchange makes literally no sense to an English speaker. So this is Simon's footnote. There is a play on words here that is difficult to adequately translate. The boy thought he heard the witch say she wanted to go to the ridge of the roof. The Muon sauce, <clears throat> which I'm not doing justice to there, um, when in fact she uttered a place name, Yuln sauce. So there's a pun here that just doesn't translate. Anyways, he says he wants to go up to the roof beam. 
he said, and then he went up and down between the earth and the ridge of the roof all night and knocked himself almost to death because he had misheard. After that, the boy went into service there, and in the evening of the same day, a year afterwards, he sat and lay down to sleep on the bench, and stared so eerily before him with open eyes, just like that the woman took the horn from the hearth, greased her broom. Then she flew up the chimney again. The boy noticed where she had hidden the horn, and when she had definitely gone, he also flew off. They saw no more of the boy or the sleigh. This took the place, this took place on the farm Kiasta, and the Kiasta horn is renowned even today. But then there was a woman on a farm in Dovra, who was also a witch. It was one Christmas Eve, her maid was washing a brewing vat. Well, meanwhile, the woman took out her grease horn and greased her broom, and just like that, flew up the chimney. The girl thought this was a foul kind of art, took the horn and put a little grease on the vat, and then she flew off and didn't stop before she came to <clears throat> Broco. There she met a whole host of witches and old Eric himself, and he preached for them, and when they were finished, he wanted to look them over and make sure he'd met them all. Then he caught sight of this maid who sat in the brewing vat. He didn't recognize her, for she hadn't registered herself with him. So he asked the woman <clears throat> she was with if she would register. The woman thought so. So old Eric gave the girl a book and asked her to write in it. He meant she should write her name. But she wrote what school children usually write when they try a new pen. The one who feeds me is God, in Jesus' name. Now, what do you write when you get a new pen? Because I'm sure it's not that. <clears throat> and she was thus allowed to keep it, for old Eric was not a fellow enough to take it back. But there was clamor and uproar on the mountain, don't you know? The witches took crops and whipped everything they had to ride on, and all at once they set off through the windy weather. The girl wasn't slow, but also took a crop and whipped the brewing vat and set off after them. They sat down once and rested on a high mountain. Below there was a broad valley with a big lake, and on the other side was another high mountain. When the witches had rested, they whipped and went over. The girl wondered whether she could go across too. At last she whipped and came over to the other side, too, and was unharmed. The devil, how quick this brewing vat is, she said. But she suddenly dropped the book and fell down and came no further, because she had spoken and called upon him, even though she had not registered. She had to walk the rest of the way, wading through the snow, for she had no free ride any longer, and it was many leagues. <clears throat> it may be interesting to fly with witches on broomsticks and in brewing vessel vessels, I said, but it must be terrible once in a while. The north wind is bitter at altitude, and you may break your neck before you know it. Is it, it is better, therefore, to go to the church tower gatherings. You may watch them as you sit on an upturned heap of turf. Is that not so, Pergrave Digger? No, you shouldn't sit on sod, said Pergrave Digger, Digger didactically. You should stand with a sod of turf lifted high in each hand, and they should be cut virtions, <clears throat> which means I could give you the whole tale of this word, but the short version is they need to be cut counterclockwise or against the rotation of the sun in the northern hemisphere the folklore and you should have your hymn book on your breast and three grains of barley in your mouth one grain means our lord one means his son and the third means the holy spirit and when you place yourself such that neither old eric nor the witches will try anything had he done this, a man I've heard of, then perhaps he would have come better of it. 
Well, he did come from it, in a way. But it was with his nose and both ears, as they say. The man had heard <clears throat> that the witches held a tumultuous lick and uproar in the church tower in the evenings during the holidays. He thought that he would like to join them, and so he went up one Christmas Eve and sat in a corner. He probably had some turf with him, but I don't suppose he'd done it correctly. Just like that, they began to arrive, one which, after the other, flew through the apertures. Some on brooms, some on shovels, some on goats, and some on rams, and on all manner of strange things otherwise. Amongst all these was a particular woman, neighbor of his. And when she saw him, she flew over and stuck her little finger up his nose and held him like this, just as I might hold a trout by the gills and flew out of the belfry. Will you promise that you will never tell what you've seen me here, or shall I drop you? She said. Never, he said, for he was an obstinate one. Come and catch me, devil, he screamed as she dropped him. And so... <coughs> <coughs> I inhaled what should have been swallowed. <coughs> My own spit. One second. Come and catch me, devil, he screamed as she dropped him. And so the devil came driving in a narrow sled and stood beneath and caught him so that he didn't so much as scrape his knee. Now the devil would drive him home too. But the man sat striking and shouting and carrying on so that the devil had difficulty remaining on the runners. And as they came close to his farm, he drove at a water trough so that the sled tipped over and the devil ended up lying on one side of the water trough and he on the other. Had he not done this, then he would not have escaped the devil's claws, but now the devil had no more power over him. How lucky you've been, said the devil. Had I known that you would escape me in this manner, then I wouldn't have traveled so far for your miserable soul. When you called me, I was north of Trondheim, holding on the back of a girl who was wringing her child's neck. Now the grave digger said that, now the grave digger said that he could not remember any more witch stories, but since he'd begun so well, I thought I should take the opportunity to ask him if he had any tell of the subterraneans, which we've covered quite a bit on this show the little people under the ground in Norwegian folklore and uh, actually in German folklore as well <clears throat> and Irish Celtic really it's a lot of places um, hmm, he said I might well have heard something from my aunt perhaps when she was a girl she was at modem in service with the parson there. <clears throat> Telemann, I think she called him. There was once upon a time in the spring when the manure was to be driven out. The parson enlisted a lot of folk, for he was a great man to farm the land, and he asked folk from far and wide from all corners of the village to help. Now an apprentice to a certain man was also invited, but he was unreasonably fond of society. When his master told him one evening to go to bed so that he could be ready to drive the fields at eight, he was so glad that he lay tossing and turning all night and couldn't sleep. There wasn't a clock there, so he couldn't tell what time it was. So he got up at around midnight, harnessed the horses to draw, and drove to the parsonage. 
but no living soul there was up at yet such an hour. So we walked around, watching out for some way of passing the time. And just as he walked, he came into the churchyard, and he washed the sleep from his eyes in the ditch that was full of water, for there had recently been a shower of rain. And from that moment, he had second sight, which just means he can see uncanny things, like the dead, or in this case, the subterraneans, the fey folk. <clears throat> but he was half distracted too and they called him mad either he left service or he served out the ear i couldn't say which but afterwards he wandered hanging around in the village where there was a banquet or something else was happening and offered to chase out the subterranean one time there was a wedding on a farm called prestaru who and they were wedding a baby's head at Comparu on the same day. <clears throat> then he was perplexed, for he could not decide which he should go to. But in the end, he went to the wedding farm. When he had been sitting there for a while, he caught a hold of the master of the kitchen. You look after what you have well, you do, he said. Don't you see that the subterraneans are drinking from the beer bucket you've put in the corner there? Each moment it grows emptier, but if you'll allow me to stay while the letting wedding lasts, then I'll chase them away nicely. Yes, you can surely stay. But how will you get them out, the master of the kitchen said. You'll see, said the boy, and he took the tub and put it in the midst of the floor, and he drew a large chalk ring around it. Now take a large club, he said to the master of the kitchen, and when I wave at you, then strike in the middle of the ring. It makes no difference where I am. When I've got them all in the ring, then strike with all your might. When he had said this, he began to run around. He went both high and low and shooing and chasing them into the ring. The master of the kitchen could hardly keep on his feet, for he was laughing so hard at all the boy's mad antics. And everyone who saw it thought him mad. But, when they, <clears throat> but then they saw that he was not as mad as they had supposed. For when he waved at the master of the kitchen and the master of the kitchen struck, there was a scream and a whimper. That was heard throughout the house. And those who came to the wedding farm from the direction of Comperu told that they had heard such a rushing and a whining in the air that sounded like a crowd of folk all speaking at the same time. To Comperu, to Comperu, to wet the baby's head, to Comperu, to wet the baby's head. Here ended Per Gravedigger's tale. He could remember no more that evening, he said, and began chasing the sexton's goat out of the churchyard. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know that we have time for the, the bonus one. Uh, I wasn't sure how long it would take, and the fact that it's all set in a particular character voice slows it down. Um... But, uh, yeah... Um, <clears throat> do you guys still like the Holder Tales? I like the, I like the uh, characterizations that Esbjornsson does as much as they made him unpopular. And I also like getting a feel for the environments um, that he, he got these stories from, that he's sort of traveling across the land um, trying to find um, <laughs> stories and, and just having to find random people. an active chat tonight see if there's anything i need to respond to jump store says my this is a pen is a hatalia reference i was assume what you write first when england is teaching japan english he uses the sentence this is a pen while also admitting that he's never used that sentence before himself Uh, Tammy, I believe, is talking about the Lunar Festival. It says, I got my daughter a flippy stuffed animal and its head turned around in the way you could have gone flippy and evil flippy. Oh, maybe this is a reference to something I don't know then. 
GS says, I'm sure the turf wasn't cut wit or whatever. Yeah, Vitterchens or something like that. It's a wild word. Uh, Uncle Kitty says, um, I like the Halder Tales, though they weren't what I remember them being. Um, uh, do, do Expand. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, just that you don't remember them being um, so novelistic. Because <clears throat> that's kind of, that's the big thing with them. They're done from Miss Bjornsson's perspective. They are very descriptive. They are very interested in the characters telling the story. Uh, GS says, I'm curious about Scandinavian skulls, and we'll look them up. <laughs> um, oh, the, uh, oh, the anthropologist. Oh, I don't know, it's probably, if it's not just a passing reference to somebody who looks up bones, then it might be a, given the era, a reference to something like, um, skull measuring, whatever the hell that's called. <clears throat> Uh, Zombie Wolf says, random trivia. Dog owners in Germany are required by law to spend at least two hours with their dogs twice a day. I bet the dogs in Germany are very happy puppers. If you're watching, um, Jorgen, is that true? Uh, Uncle Kitty said, I'm betting they get confused with Haldra sometimes. Oh, somewhat. Oh, if you, if you aren't familiar, I did a, um, if you're talking about the Wikipedia one, we, we did talk about this a bit. Um, Halder is just a fey folk from Norwegian and and I'm not I'm really unclear why the Wikipedia has framed it as if it's only like the siren uh format of them there are sirens around but I don't know again I even went through the the sources on the Wikipedia page for Halder um uh, I was pretty disappointed in what they were using as reference there's only three sources one of them is quite modern, and the other two aren't really traditional collected tales. They're sort of passing references in other books. There are better sources on what Halder is. Um, I'm not the right person to be correcting a Wikipedia page, but that Wikipedia page needs correcting. <clears throat> um, uh, which is to say, by the way, um, I, I'm, it, there isn't any good reason to doubt that Halders might have included seductive siren type spirits um in fact i can think of a couple of tales where that occurs but um uh yeah yeah uncle kitty says halder are supposed to be fey women with tails but i don't know where that's coming from because i can find no specific reference to it it might be coming from a different area but at least as far as norwegian lore goes as Bjornsson and mo were the the keystone collectors of those tales. I don't know who else they'd be referencing, and they don't reference as Bjornsson and Mo in the the um, Wikipedia. <clears throat> Tammy Morelli says I was talking about a cartoon on YouTube called Happy Happy Tree Friends. Oh my God, it's been a long time since I thought of that. Yes, I know Happy Tree Friends. Uh, Uncle Kitty says at least if you watch modern Norwegian horror films, yeah, and I would love to know what the roots on that are because it obviously has a cultural impact it is a common portrayal of halder um but um i i can i can i can give sources from the eras that they would have to have been picking because folklore didn't really get collected prior to that and uh they don't come up that way women at these siren formats <clears throat> um uh halder are just fey basically uh, it's more complex than that. I said a bit more on it on in my episode of the Esoteric World of uh, the Halder Folk, um, which is a stream I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, one of the nice things about getting good translations from people like Simon Roy Hughes is the ability to have English language sources to sort of address stuff like that. Um Again, I'm not precluding the fact that that is a version of it. But I can also point towards several references to Halder that aren't. Um, and probably more than the others. Uh, so yeah, wherever it comes from. <clears throat> Anyhow, 
the other one I was going to read, which uh, I won't read tonight because it would take us pretty far over time, is called uh, Hauling with Angelica Root. It's a much shorter one, um, but um, it's more about subterraneans. <clears throat> Uh, by the way, Holder Tales, what he calls Holder Tales, uh, Peter Christian Nares Bjornsson, really just kind of means fairy tales. That's that's the most uh, direct translation, as I understand it, of that term. Um, Holder is a type of spirit, uh, the, the wilds, as I said in the other episode. Nonetheless, there is nothing 100% right or 100% wrong in the world of folklore, because we are talking about far-reaching uh, across time and space over many different areas uh, accounts and versions of tales uh, nothing is ever consistent in folklore so it would not surprise me if we also had versions of it that matched up quite well to the Norwegian horror film versions of Holdre. nonetheless <clears throat> thank you very much to uh, Witchery, Uncle Kitty, Tammy Morelli, Suki Matsuba, GS uh, Jum Store, Zombie Wolf, and uh, I think I already said Uncle Kitty, but in case I didn't, Uncle Kitty, <clears throat> uh, for tuning in and watching tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I hope it gives you guys ideas for your own creative enterprises, of course. I'll keep the fire warm for you. You have a good sleep. <laughs>